I'm Lori Young, director of the Wilderness Institute, and I'd like to start today by thanking the Cinnabar Foundation, Rick and Susie Gratz, MCAT, and the Provost's Office for their generous contributions to this series and helping make it possible. If you're joining us for the first time, uh, there are schedules in the back with the entire series. We've got five more speakers to come. Next week, Hugh Safford will be joining us from California, and he'll be talking about what we as Montanans can learn from fire research in his home state. And so now we're ready to move to the main event for the night, which is a lecture on water and climate change by Sarah Bates, a foremost expert in Western water policy. We're very fortunate to have her in Missoula and have this opportunity to talk with her. Um, I've asked Martin Nye, who is a professor of natural resources policy in the College of Forestry and Conservation here at the University of Montana to give her introduction and tell you a little bit about her. Come on up, Martin. Well, is my, pr does this sound okay? It's my privilege to introduce Ms. Sarah Bates. I am not exaggerating when I say that Sarah is a giant in her field. And when you consider that her field and expertise is water law, that actually means something. Sarah earned her Bachelor of Science in Wildlife Biology at Colorado State University and her JD at the University of Colorado, where she studied under the Obi-Wan Kenobis of her fields, Charles Wilkinson and David Getches. Sarah lives here in Missoula, appropriately set back on the banks of one of the few underappropriated creeks in the state. She's a senior fellow at the UM Center for Natural Resources and Environmental Policy, an outfit obviously smart enough to capitalize on Sarah's standing and national reputation. One of the things that I most admire about Sarah is her ability to apply rigorous scholarship to real world problems. She's engaged at every level, from the study of water law to the nitty-gritty practice of conservation. She has obviously written a ton of books, articles, and so forth. But she's, she's also worked for an impressive list of conservation organizations, think tanks, foundations, and water challenge states and tribes. This includes impressive stints as director of the Can -Can Grand Canyon Trust in Utah, as Associate Director of the Natural Resources Law Center in Boulder and Managing, Edi Ma Managing Editor for the Chronicle of Community. She was also part of the Western Water Policy Review Advisory Commission, whom had the unenviable task of uh, making sense of Western water management and what, what can be done about it. Somewhere along the way, Sarah learned how to take her legal and academic work and get non-legal and non-academic people to actually read it. And this is really an amazing achievement. And she doesn't know this, but Sarah was also an important part of my career development. After reading all of her work focused on water law and policy as a graduate student, I decided that I wanted to be a water policy expert. But then I read all the non-Sarah Bates water law and policy stuff and realized I made a terrible mistake. <laughs> I, I changed specialties quickly. Think of a law of Western water, like the law of gravity, the law of water running uphill to money, the law of water supply creating demand, and so on. And I'll bet that Sarah has written about it. But what she does even better is make connections. Take, for her example, her highly acclaimed article a couple of years ago, linking Western water supply and law to regional growth and private land development. It seems so common sense, such a natural linkage, but it was up to Sarah and her colleague to flesh out the details, to figure out how we, met, we might get from here to there. Tonight, Sarah is gonna tackle a small, trivial issue. The role of water and water law in a warming West. The policy options for responding to climate change. Godspeed to her. But I can't think of anyone else who could do a, better, do a better job of showing us the different paths that could be taken. So it is my honor to introduce Ms. Sarah Bates. Thank you, Martin. I love the Obi-Wan Kenobi. I um, should have brought the lightsaber I was playing with with my son this afternoon. He would have liked that a lot. Well, I was. I'm really pleased to be here, and I'm humbled by that introduction. That was, that was great. And I've learned so much from what Martin's doing in his scholarship, so I'm glad you moved away from water, because you're telling us all how to do it in the forest world. Um, 
And I'm really pleased to be part of this series, so thank you very much for the introduction. Water, or the lack of it, is what really defines our region, the West. Rivers have literally shaped our landscape. The availability of water or our ability to access water has shaped how we live in this place. Much of the water, um, much of the water that we have that we use is held in what you might think of as virtual reservoirs in snowpacks in the mountains high in this region. But we've also held back a lot of our water in man-made reservoirs behind enormous dams. And we have additional reservoirs of water underground in the aquifers that we tap for agriculture and domestic use. When water gets scarce, we end up getting to know each other a lot better. I just realized I don't have my uh, clicker for the, where's the, the remote control. Right here. Sorry about that. You suddenly realize you, you need the Obi-Wan tool. Can't do it with my fingers. Flip my hair to sound good, okay. <laughs> in fact, I'd say that we're a lot more aware of water in this part of the country than most people are in the rest of the country. But even so, we have a lot we need to figure out. And in fact, we've been talking about this for a long time. I got to start uh, working on Western water issues right after law school, working with Mark Reisner, who was the author of a very influential book called Cadillac Desert. Many of you probably are aware of it. It was a wake-up call about what he called the American West and its disappearing water. It's a quarter century old now, but it's still completely relevant and a very useful read. A recent article that just came out in the National Proceedings, or the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences um, was really amazing. It was a group of about a dozen scientists who reviewed all of Mark Reisner's predictions and conclusions and tested them scientifically and found that almost every one of them was accurate when held up against these rigorous standards. They found strong scientific support for all of his observations other than one about how quickly our reservoirs would be silting up. So when I speak to people about water and climate change, which I get to do fairly often, I urge them to pick up this classic book, whether for the first time or for the tenth. And remember that many of today's challenges are inherited from the past policy decisions. They're not just a sudden onset of unfortunate hydrology. Today we have an even urgent, more urgent need to figure out how to work out our water conflicts and how to manage this resource better in light of the projected impacts of climate change. So this lecture series, uh, I was lucky enough to come last week and hear Joel Berger's talk. Uh, it's featuring a lot of talks about science, a lot of descriptions of the impacts of climate change, what we know and what we're just beginning to learn. My focus tonight is a little bit different. It's on policy which you can think of as the framework within which we make plans and make decisions and resolve conflicts. But I'll start for a minute uh, to orient us around the impacts of climate change on water and talk about what we know about climate change and water and what that suggests that we might want to do when it comes to policy. I think the point to keep in mind is that most of the projected impacts of climate change will affect our water adding pressures to a system that was already under a lot of pressure. So climate science tells us to expect wider variations in our water supplies, higher overall demands due to warmer temperatures, and overall a lot less certainty in the future. And in fact, some of these changes are already underway. So let's just have a brief summary of what we know. First of all, there's no doubt that we're getting warmer. We know that the Earth is warming. Um, average annual temperatures increased over two degrees Fahrenheit in the last half century. The past decade included some of the warmest temperatures ever recorded, and we expect this to continue with notable extremes in all kinds of weather. This is affecting our water resources. In fact, hydrologists tell us that the changes are already underway and they're impacting our rivers. Both of the graphics up here on the screen are the work of the University of Washington Climate Impacts Group. And they show that we're seeing two things at the same time, overall reduced snowpack and earlier runoff of the melting snow water. 
the key point of these two trends is that there's less snow in what I called earlier our virtual reservoirs of snowpack in the high country, and the runoff is coming earlier in bigger pulses, and more than our man-made reservoirs on the rivers are going to be able to hold. The EPA did this diagram to just summarize the impacts of climate change on water. We can imagine more impacts than this when we just think a little bit about all the ways that water is put to use in a part of the country around here. We're likely to see reduced summer flows and volumes, increased drought frequency and severity, changes in hydrological extremes such as spring flooding and summer low flows, possible changes in groundwater, especially if we turn to it as an alternative supply when surface waters grow short. Po um, Increased water temperatures when the flows get lower, and that can have impacts on fish and water quality. Changes in sediments and nutrients. Altered habitat for fish and wildlife. Changed conditions for hydropower production, which increasingly is being looked at as an alternative to reduce carbon emissions. And of course, impacts on many kinds of recreation that we don't always think of as being related to water. Tourism, skiing, camping, boating, fishing. The key point is that we have to start changing the way that we think about our water supply. <coughs> We've used past conditions to predict what we'll have in the future. In fact, our water loss system itself is based on protecting people's expectations on that those conditions are likely to continue. Now we really need to look ahead. We need to be considering a climate-altered hydrology and to reflect that in our policy. When I think about it, I think in terms of, of which direction we look when we make our policy. We've been making policies based on the past, looking in the rearview mirror. We have to pivot. We have to start looking forward and look forward and fo focus on flexibility and being able to figure out how to change with new information. That's a challenge for people who work in and around water policy and really for all of us who are affected by it. I think it's easiest to see the problem thinking about a particular basin. So this is the Colorado River Basin. Uh, some people think of the Colorado River as probably ground zero for the impacts of climate change on water in the West. The Colorado River draws water from seven states, from the Rockies to the Gulf of California, and serves over 30 million people. The annual flows have always been highly variable, almost entirely dependent on snow melt from the Rockies and evened out by the construction of some big reservoirs on the river system. In fact, the Colorado has the largest storage capacity of any river in our country. It, it has the capacity to store four times the annual flow in the reservoirs that now exist. But the river's in trouble. These reservoirs have dropped to historic lows in recent years. In October, it was the lowest um, the, the reservoir level was the lowest it had been since these reservoirs had been filled. Demands have increased while supplies have dropped, and the river's probably already in a deficit, as is showed by these numbers here. This is a problem already because the Colorado River water is divided, as I said, among seven states, but also the country of Mexico, in a complex series of legal agreements. The basic document of the law of the river is the 1922 compact among the seven river basin states. And the problem started there because the compact assumed flows that, haven't, uh, that were unusually high during the time that they negotiated the compact. So the flow levels that they allocated were more than the river has to give. The states have negotiated since then how to share some of the shortages that are coming. They reached a very important agreement in 2007 uh, on sharing shortages but we're already coming close to the threshold of lower water levels that they didn't think would happen for another 15 years. Now all of this, you overlay on top climate change predictions of perhaps a reduction of 20 to 30 percent uh, stream flow in the Colorado River. And you've got talk of litigation, the need for new agreements, and a lot of concern about water security in a very important part of our country. The Colorado River Basin poses what policymakers frequently call a wicked problem, but it's not unique. We're facing similar challenges on different scales throughout the West. So where does this leave us? 
Like John Wesley Powell said when he was launching his dories into the unknown stretches of the Grand Canyon in the 19th century, there is a lot ahead that we can't predict. But like he said, that shouldn't stop us from taking steps now based on what we know. And indeed, we may conjecture many things. Some of us make our careers around doing such things. And we will. We're engaged in a lot of efforts to mitigate the causes of climate change. There's a lot of mitigation work and a lot of debate nationally about what we ought to be doing to prevent things from getting worse. But water managers are looking at what they need to do now to adapt to the changes that are already underway, now and in the coming decades. We might group these solutions into a few categories that I've listed here. Make more water, maybe. Use less water, certainly. And protect our water sources. We better do that. There are a number of projects underway to augment our water supplies. Cloud seeding and other weather modification efforts have been used for a long time and with sort of mixed results. Desalination uh, is an important and being looked at as at least one important component of enhancing water supplies in coastal areas, but it's very expensive. Uh, treating brackish groundwater for use, generally again in coastal areas. Capturing runoff that otherwise might run off to the ocean. If you're in a coastal city, that could gain you some more water. There are many proposals, there have been and there will be more, to bring more water in through pipelines from other parts of the country that have more water than the dry parts. Um, proposals to bring water from Canada, from the Mississippi River, uh, sometimes farther away. These are expensive proposals. And ultimately, they're limited by the hydrological cycle and the fact that you can't really make new water. But it's useful to understand that water managers who are working in places like the Colorado River today are in fact counting on augmentation as an important part of their strategy moving ahead. So it is part of our policy discussion. Of course, it makes a lot of sense to use the water that we've already developed more carefully. That is, pursue conservation and efficiency goals in all of our water use. Conservation measures are widely available, consistently found to be the cheapest path for meeting new water demands and, and projected increases, and to adapt to climate change impacts. As illustrated here, there are substantial opportunities for saving water in our landscaping and outdoor water use around our homes. But in fact, irrigated agriculture is an enormous water user in this part of the country and will be an important target for conservation efforts. Experts have produced reports recently recommending that to address projected climate change in the near term, we're probably going to have to reduce our water use by 20 to 40 percent across the board. That's a pretty ambitious target. But equally important is to take better care of our water sources, the headwaters in our mountains and the water quality of our streams and aquifers. This relates to the theme of this lecture series, the Wilderness Lecture Series, because in fact, as I mentioned before, the virtual reservoirs of snowpack in our mountains are often in wilderness areas, and that's increasingly where we're going to be looking for the security of our water supplies when we need it. But it also relates to how we build in urban areas and whether we allow water to run in its natural channels and stay clean while doing so. Oh, look at that. There's the protect the source. We're moving ahead. Thank you. Clearly, we need to prepare for uncertainty in our future water supplies. We need to take care of what we have. We need to build flexibility into the system. And we need to be prepared to adapt to new information and conditions as we learn about them. This isn't just an engineering problem. It's not a question that can be answered by climate scientists or hydrologists. Scientists can help describe a problem. Engineers can help design options for technical solutions. But policy is where we look when we decide what to do with this information. What choices will we make to apply what we know and our values to the problems that are before us? When it comes to water policy, a lot of historical choices set the stage for the rules that apply today. Many of these rules are very rigid. They protect the status quo. And they're not necessarily adaptive to the changes that we're seeing. So there's a lot of interest in policy reform 
and some changes are already underway. So what I'm going to do next is summarize some of the changes that we're beginning to see and highlight where water policy seems to be heading in response to climate change. Western water law reflects historical conditions and choices. It's largely a legacy of the, how the West was developed. The original rules were developed from mining camps and the basic rule of Western water law is first in time, first in right, which is also called the prior appropriation doctrine. A water right under this rule is established by putting water to use and it's protected by law from those who come later. It's important to note that prior appropriation and these rules were not handed down on stone tablets. Other models emerged in other parts of the country and either, even in local areas of the West. And they had a lot more to do with sharing water. Um, but the prior appropriation doctrine made sense at, a, at that time and in this place given the conditions of the, of the arid West. In most cases, settling the arid West required irrigation, moving water from a stream to a faraway place. Um, usually this required people to invest in infrastructure, so they needed some certainty about these, their rights to keep using the water. And many of these uses were taking place on federal lands, so you couldn't base your right to use water on land ownership. And it was just a familiar rule too, because it was developed in the mining camps, so people were comfortable with it. The key point of Western water allocation under this rule is that it doesn't depend on where you are on a river. It depends on when you got to the river and when you put the water to use. The legacy of these rules is that people own rights to use water. Water is a valuable property right, but it's a right of use. The water itself remains a public resource, and rules emphasize utilitarian applications, putting rivers to work, and they emphasize certainty to protect these investments that were necessary to do that. For the most part, the federal government stayed out of the water allocation business and deferred to the states to settle their disputes. But it retained an important regulatory role, and we're seeing this role grow today. We're seeing this grow in water quality rules, in endangered species protection, and in assertion of Indian reserved water rights, which is a topic that we could have a separate two-hour conversation about. But the key point is that the federal government does have an important role perhaps a growing one, and, but the states are generally recognized as the key players in sorting out water within their borders. This history has given us some basic ground rules of Western water policy. And there are variations among the Western states, but they all share these key rules. First of all, certainty is essential. Remember the need to protect investments. The second important rule is that People are prevented, we are prohibited from harming other water users who have rights on the system. And that is, everyone with an established right can more or less assume that conditions will continue in the future as they were when they began. And third, the third ground rule is to really emphasize, max, to maximize beneficial use of water. We have rules against waste and speculation. And keep in mind that historically, waste included letting water flow downstream and not be put to use. So providing water for fish historically was seen as a wasteful use of water. That's one area that we've seen some change in. So what were the consequences of these policy choices that were made back in the 19th century? Well, there were many benefits. We, had, we made a lot of investments. There were many, many private investments, and a lot of public ones in water development that made new settlement possible. The system has succeeded in giving certainty to water users. We've done a good job of putting our rivers to work for human benefit. I'd say the goals of water policy of the 19th century have lar largely been met. But we've also had significant environmental impacts. These have been well documented if they're not entirely understood yet. We've had stream flows that have been reduced or changed. Prior appropriation allowed you to take all the water out of a stream if that was your right. We have damaged ecological systems because we've dramatically changed the plumbing of our large river systems. And we have many cases of diminished water quality that have a lot to do with how water's been taken out of our rivers. In addition to these environmental impacts, we have seen a lot of economic and social impacts. Water moved away from home rivers to be used in other watersheds. Lost business opportunities and property values 
The photo on the right on this slide shows land subsidence from uncontrolled groundwater pumping in California. Permanently lost aquifer space and damaged farmland up on top. And because these impacts have been dramatic, but the benefits have also been dramatic, the stakes are high. And these are reflected in the fierce battles over western rivers and in new calls to work together differently. Over the past three decades or so, we've seen tremendous changes in public values for water and for river systems. We've seen federal legislation in the 1960s and 70s and beyond that have set new national priorities for preservation and restoration and new controls on water use. A few examples include the Clean Water Act, the Endangered Species Act, the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act, and other legislation has been specific to particular places like the Grand Canyon Protection Act of 1992. Related to this is the mobilization and engagement of new citizen groups. People who have demanded to be heard and who have demanded that the processes by which decisions are made about water be opened up beyond the traditional group of water right holders. And in the process, they've challenged a lot of the assumptions about future water needs <laughs> and impacts. All of this has been driven by dramatic demographic and economic changes in the Western United States, forcing shifts in how we use and protect water. And we're seeing a west-wide shift in how this is happening. Different uses are now recognized as beneficial. It's no longer seen as wasteful to provide water for whitewater recreation or for fish, or even in many cases for scenic preservation. And we're seeing changes in state policies as a result. But now climate change may be the biggest catalyst of all for policy reform. It's forcing us to reconsider the traditional emphasis on certainty, even the definitions of what's beneficial. And the upside of all these scary predictions is that it may open the door for discussions of change that were not allowed 10 to 20 years ago. This is a picture of Pat Mulroy, who's the manager of the Southern Nevada Water Authority, which is facing really dire consequences for their patterns of water use and their ending up on the short end of the negotiating stick in the allocation of waters in the Colorado River Basin. And probably nobody is more aware or outspoken of the risks of these changes coming. She's actually been pretty brave about talking about it. So there are changes happening. And when it comes to water policy, this is always sort of an evolutionary process. What I'd like to do next is talk about some policy guideposts. Maybe you describe them as principles for new policies that can help us deal with uncertainties of climate change along with all of these other pressures that are facing Western water. Some of the signs we've seen about impacts of climate change are worrisome. They, in, they indicate conflict and crisis. But we're also seeing some more promising signs of movement. And I'll try to mention these briefly as I go as examples of the positive side of evolution of water policy. Remember what I said about this being a long conversation about Western water policy. Many of the reforms that I'm going to describe to you now have been around, they've been on the drawing board, they've been discussed for many years. It's not like we need to invent a new toolbox to react to climate change. We have a lot of the tools available. What, what is possible now is that the catalyst of climate change, the worrisome impacts coming, might make some of those more politically acceptable. So the first principle I'd like to suggest for policy changes is that we need to recognize the connections between surface and groundwater to manage them in a more coordinated way and also to manage our water and land use in a way that protects our water sources. Many western states do not adequately control groundwater use. They allow many exceptions to regulation as is the case with domestic wells that are exempted from uh, permitting and allowed to proliferate as they have in Montana. In this state, perhaps 60 to 70 percent of new homes that are built outside of our urban areas are built with these exempt wells. They're potentially interfering with senior water rights and depleting our streams. Groundwater could be used and should be viewed as a tremendous buffer against the changes that may come to our surface water as a result of climate change impacts, but only if we're careful with how we use it. We're starting to see some 
in some encouraging progress in dealing with groundwater depletion. For example, in some cases, developers are being required to purchase mitigation credits before they can build homes that are gonna depend on these exempt wells. In many cases, well, in many particular cases, not broadly throughout the West, groundwater and surface water are being managed conjunctively, which recognizes them as connected in every legal sense. And in some cases, groundwater is being banked, recharged, and then used when surface water supplies grow low. We're a long way from sustainable use of our groundwater, but the topic at last is on the table and getting some of the discussion that it deserves. My second principle for policy change is that new demands for water should be met first through conservation of existing supplies. Conservation is the cheapest source of new water. And in the process of saving water and not going out to get new water and moving it, we're actually reducing greenhouse gas emissions because it's actually very energy intensive to move water from one place to another. And often that results in the emissions of carbon containing um, substances, which just makes the water shortage problem worse in the future. The whole idea of a water footprint is just catching on. And our footprint in the West is far greater than other parts of the country. There's a lot of room in this area, in this region, to save water. And our policies could go a lot farther than they do toward encouraging that. In fact, cities and major water providers are already pursuing conservation with enthusiasm, in large extent because this saves them a lot of money. The diagram that's here on this slide is a schematic for what's called the Prairie Waters Program in Aurora, Colorado. Aurora is located right near Denver on the Front Range and it relies on water that's been imported from the other side of the mountains. It's a very expensive supply of water and the return flows from that water had been going into the Platte River after a single use and, and going on downstream. Well, this is a pretty fast growing area. It had been a fast growing area. And they were looking at perhaps much more expensive supplies to meet their projected needs. So they figured out a way to capture the water as it returns toward the river, let it filter down through the ground, through the tributaries, pipe it back up 34 miles toward the treatment facility, treat it, and put it back into their domestic supply system. Now this is basically reusing wastewater, but it's the same water that would have it had been treated and would be going downstream to be used by others. Um, this is probably the kind of system that we're gonna see a lot more of, this kind of investment in making the most of the water that you've already developed. We probably, in addition to these voluntary measures that are being done to save money, we probably will be seeing more regulation that mandates conservation measures. We already have those in some cases with energy efficient appliances. Um, we're likely to see that sort of thing. That would be a, a natural role of the federal government in um, having regulations about water efficient um, measures in houses or in other uses. My third principle for water policy change is to recognize the tremendous environmental services of functioning aquatic systems and to take steps to protect and restore their resiliency. Given the projected impacts of climate change, we'll depend on these resources even more in the future. Think about homes and human safety, human safety that are protected by water as it spreads over floodplains that have been protected from development. Water quality gets improved when it's filtered through wetlands. Late season water supplies are improved when the water's held back by beaver dams, as the one in this picture, or mountain meadows, where the water's held high in the mountains and then flows down later when it's needed. Trees and other riparian vegetation help reduce water temperatures to protect fish and water quality. We're starting to see some promising movement in this direction too. Some efforts to protect our headwaters through interesting new partnerships. In Denver, Again, we're turning to Colorado as one of our examples. Um, Colorado's under a lot of fire, a lot of pressure with their water. But the Denver, the Denver water provider, it's called Denver Water, has entered into a partnership with the Forest Service where a small user fee that's imposed on people's bills goes to fund forest restoration work up in the <coughs> National Forest to protect the headwaters that provides the clean water for Denver Water. And this all got started after a great big fire a few years ago 
that resulted in a huge influx of sedimentation into the city's reservoirs. It was enormously expensive to clean out. And they saw that if they helped the Forest Service um, with forest management efforts, they would benefit by having a higher quality water supply. We're seeing other kinds of partnerships like this in Santa Fe, in Seattle, Salt Lake City, and probably other places as well. And in urban areas, we're seeing more awareness of how our development impacts water running into rivers and aquifers, measures to clean up runoff and leave more permeable surfaces for water to flow where it naturally should go. And in the course of doing that, it'll be cleaner because it hasn't been running off pavement with a lot of accumulated oil and, and other pollutants. It's a big challenge to connect people to their water supply. When I think about what it's going to take to encourage citizens to think about where their water comes from and support policies that protect that. I think about the local food movement and I think about how we've made a lot of progress in, in encouraging people to think about where their food comes from and what impact all their individual choices make. I think we have a long way to go with water but that might be a good model for us. My fourth principle for water policy is a recognition that our demands for water change over time and they'll continue to do so. There's been a long history of water transfers from irrigated agriculture to urban uses, and more recently to restore stream flows. This has often been done badly. We might call it buy and dry, where farms have been purchased, the water's been moved to a city, and the, the farm turns to weeds and, and, and just no use at all. Um, it hurts the community that, of the people that lived around there. Some of the more promising new approaches that we're starting to see now are more flexible and adaptive and supportive of continued farming, perhaps with a higher value and using less water. So in some cases, people are cities, water providers, and sometimes conservation groups are paying farmers to install efficient technology to use less water and then allow them to transfer that saved water to these other uses. In a lot of cases, there are um, temporary options of transfers. In other words, kind of dry year options. If the water conditions drop so that a city or another, um, if, if the river levels are low and there's a habitat need for more water, in those conditions, water will be moved out of the agricultural use. So it's a temporary provision. And we're also seeing some market-driven approaches to do smart fallowing of fields and encouraging use of less water to grow higher valued crops so that more water is available for these other uses. It's important to prioritize which farmlands we don't want to lose and to link this process to local planning. That's what wasn't being done before when these were so controversial. There's a lot of action in Montana to use this kind of effort to restore stream flows. Um, a lot of great partnerships by Trout Unlimited and the Montana Water Trust, which is now part of Clark Fork Coalition, entering into these kinds of arrangements with irrigators and obtaining enhanced stream flows to help adapt to climate change. So changing water uses will go along with the changing climate. We just need to be flexible and smart about how these changes take place. My final principle about water policy change is to work harder at working together. We know that conflict has been central to the history of water development in the West. But we're seeing some promising signs of new ways to address these shared challenges. There's really no choice. Water is the ultimate shared resource. We need to figure out how to address conflicts on many different scales and with a lot of different interests. There are actually a number of very interesting examples of where this is happening. And these range all the way from local watershed groups that are proliferating around Montana to large interstate bodies established by federal legislation dealing with endangered species recovery in places like the Colorado River. There's no cookie cutter approach to doing this, but there are some similar motivating factors. The stark reality of climate change impacts is really catching water managers' attention. Threats of litigation or new regulation often pushes people to the negotiating table. And in some cases, it's just a matter of good neighboring, practical problem solving. And I would say this is behind a lot of the good work of groups like the Blackfoot Challenge here in Montana. Ron Sims of Seattle had it right. There won't be any solo acts to address climate change successfully. <laughs>
In the end, it's easy to look at history of water in the West and just want to throw your hands up in despair. But despite his observation in Cadillac Desert, Mark Reisner spent his final years working to achieve changes in water storage and use in some very local places in the Central Valley of California. He didn't give up. He hoped for a better future. <coughs> Remember that I mentioned early in this talk that policy is a choice. We need to make conscious choices about how we respond to this enormous challenge. Science won't give us the answers, although we'll have to look to science for information that we need to shape our choices and to apply our values. I'm encouraged by the great interest in this subject from people that show up for lectures like this and also by new initiatives that I've gotten involved with, such as the one I have listed here, which is the Carpe Diem Water in the West program. This brings together people from all disciplines and viewpoints who are interested in addressing policy changes to respond to climate change. And I'd encourage all of you to visit this if you want to see some more examples of what I've been talking about. I really wanted to leave plenty of time to answer questions because I think probably there will be some. Um, I'd like to tell one quick story though before I do that and that is I got involved in Carpe Diem with this project um, I guess three years ago and it was following a, an eye-opening experience that I had in Wyoming. I was attending um, a conference that I was involved with a group in Wyoming bringing people together to talk about what was going to happen with climate change and water. And Wyoming is perhaps one of the more skeptical places about this, but it was a very straightforward discussion about what we know, what the impacts appear to be, and just an open question of what we're going to do. And it was very informative. And we had top water leaders from the state of Wyoming there, and we had students, and we had citizens, and we had some elected officials. And we went into roundtable discussions and we, we talked it through and we talked about what we know and, and what appears to be happening. And at the end of that full day, the head of the Water Infrastructure Commission for the state was sitting at my table and he just <coughs> sat still in reflecting on what he had heard. And he said, you know, I just don't know if our institutions are up for this. And it was for me, it was a revelation because I think if you've worked around water law for water policy for a few decades, what you mainly hear is, you know, it's all set. It doesn't need to change. And I thought, you know, maybe this is really the catalyst. Maybe this really is the wake-up call. And so when I heard about this organization and the opportunity to work with people who were thinking about what we could do, I thought it was a very positive thing. And I thought maybe there's an upside to crisis. It's the thing that sometimes gets people to the to the conversation that we need to have. So when I think about talks that I go to about climate change, I think they're often very depressing and they're a real downer. And if I were a student studying this right now, I have children who hear about climate change and wear it pretty heavily. I think it's pretty important to think that there's, there are people who are thinking hard about this. We need people with new ideas and there are perhaps new opportunities to bring that new way of thinking to help solve these problems because that's what we need to do. So I really appreciate the attention and I'd be happy to have a discussion about it. Thanks. Question, should I repeat the question for, is that helpful? The question is about the Ogallala Aquifer in the central part of the United States, a great big, a very big body of water underground that has been used at a rate that exceeds its replenishment by quite a bit for quite a long time. Um, and the question is, should we stop using it or should we, um, should we, should we let, kind of let nature catch up with what we've done? Um, that's actually the problem with most of our groundwater use right now. And it's a tough question. It's a policy question about the value of what's being done. We certainly need to 
and there have been measures taken to reduce what's being taken out of that aquifer, but we're, we're at a deficit, and um, I think for economic reasons, the crops are changing already. But it's, it's a big public policy choice. Um, the same, I think it's a harder question, is where cities have developed based on reliance on finite aquifer resources, and they don't have backup systems. That's perhaps even more worrisome. Uh, crops, you can, you can stop growing if, you, if water becomes more expensive, you have to go deeper and, and it costs more. But it's gonna be really tough if, if cities start running short because they've been tapping a finite resource, which is the case in parts of the Southwest. Yeah, question back. Um, with uh, rain barrels, you can like rain barrels, and that, just to capture runoff from like your roof for your own personal use, and I know that's still illegal in a lot of places in the West. What's, what's your opinion about that? The question is about using rain barrels to capture um, your immediate runoff. Actually, um, the last place that it was illegal by state law was Colorado, and they changed that in the last legislative session. Yeah, so. Um, but the, the concept of it being illegal is all about this preserving this ladder of priorities in the river. And the idea was um, you didn't have a right to it, and it belonged to the river. It didn't belong to you. But that's been recognized as not just a, an OK thing. But now in, in places like Seattle, a lot of the building codes require capture of runoff um, for landscaping use. And in some parts of the Southwest, they're starting to require that too. So. I, more worrisome than, than, than control, like even in Colorado where they said it was illegal, people were doing it. It was just, it was sort of an archaic way of looking at the law. But worrisome is, is things like covenants of, of homeowners groups that say you have to have a minimum square footage of bluegrass lawn around your house. And those are the case in many places and, and still are the, the case in many places. And you saw my diagram of of the proportion of domestic water that's used outdoors. It's most of the water that each house uses is for outdoor consumptive use. And <coughs> if a homeowner wants to save water by planting a more water smart landscaping and they happen to live in a development where that's actually not allowed, that's just exactly the opposite policy of what we should have. So some, that's where we're a little more behind in, in state statutes of, of actually saying, um, what covenants can and can't include that way. But I would say that's a, a bigger problem, probably. Is there any promoting uh, the waterless composting toilets that Glenn Nelson of Washington and Mays and Rockefeller, Phoenix, and Primus Maltrum? That was a question about the encouraging super efficient um, toilets for in your house, many that wouldn't even draw on the water supply. Um, there are, you know, there are efforts to change building codes to allow that to be the case, um, and it can be, but I haven't heard of any to mandate any of that. Um, there's maybe the closest to that, I don't know if it's really close, but kind of a parallel to that is the city of Santa Fe has, dis they're on pretty tight water budget, and they basically have said, we don't want any increase in our consumptive use of water, even as we grow. So when new development goes in, if you're building a new house, you have to pay to retrofit existing toilets in, I mean, toilets in existing houses to much more efficient models. You can save a lot of water that way. Um, and in fact, all of these efficiency measures have helped a lot. And a lot of cities have grown a great deal without increasing their water use. We, we've, we've made a lot of progress with in-home conservation. But as far as you suggest, I don't think our progress has been so great. Uh, do, you, do you think it's going to be a benefit or maybe a, uh, a loss to us citizens here in the city if the big corporation ends up taking over our water? This is a question about the... Um, this the recent bid put in. Yeah, the, the mountain water sale to an international company. We have um, Chris Brick here from the Clark Fork Coalition, which has just spoken up on this issue. It's, it raises concerns about what the interests will be. We already had an out-of-state private company owning our water supply, which is unusual in the state of Montana. And in most urban areas, it's usually a public, publicly owned entity. Um, so it was already a little different having this private company, but um, 
this potentially could, we could have a lot less say in how decisions are made. It, um, really, the trend is more toward, in the US, the trend is more toward public ownership of water supplies for urban areas and not toward this international ownership of supplies. But we may be seeing a different trend. I think the companies are, this is not a water company that's looking at it. It's a great big investment company and they'll have different concerns. Did you want to say something on that, Chris? No. Yeah. Is this question, did you? Oh, um, on a more international scale, uh, I know if you're a country that's applying for aid from the UN World Bank, you have to privatize your water to a multinational corporation. Do you think there's any chance of changing policies like that in the future? I mean, you see what happens in Bolivia and other parts of South America with riots, and people not even being able to have the rights to bring the call to the sky. Yeah, the questions about the, the international version of that um, and UN policies, I, I don't work in that world at all, but I'm familiar with it. And um, um, one of the ways that countries are starting to deal with that is, for example, having a constitutional right to an adequate supply of water for personal use. So South Africa is a country that actually has a constitutional right to that, and they're you know, to the extent that that'll be enforced, could be some control on that, but, but getting to it from UN policies and other international aid um, policies is way beyond my knowledge. I don't have any information on that. Some of the same concerns, though. Did you have a question? Yeah, I was just going to ask um, if you foresee a new era of dam building, given the uh, probably uncertainty of of water and the need for additional storage, or is there perhaps some other path that could go on? The question's about whether with the changes in timing and amounts of water due to climate change, we're likely to see a lot of new dams proposed. And that has been my concern. Um, I, I believe, you know, we, we went through the 90s declaring the era of dam building is over because Ronald Reagan said so, you know, he, um, signed the, or Ronald Reagan cut back the government funding of them, and Jimmy Carter, I guess, signed the hit list. But, um, you know, we really were not building any new big projects, and they were seen as archaic and too expensive. But I think we will be seeing a lot more proposals for holding water back. I think they'll be different. I don't think they'll be, we don't have a lot of those great sites for big main stem dams, but we likely will see a lot more proposals for different kinds of storage of water high up in the system to release it later. And I don't know that that's all a bad thing. I think we need to be open in all of our thinking to some really different ways of managing our water. So I had a picture of a beaver dam up here, and, and that's on purpose. There's actually a lot of studying going into the effect on hydrology and the adaptation of these natural water catchments way up high in the mountains. And it may be that we need to think about really heretical things like small, carefully placed reservoirs in wilderness areas, or some clever kinds of way of holding water underground high up in the system for releasing later. I think a lot of things are going to be proposed and we need to be balancing them all out. Nothing's gonna be a silver bullet, but that has definitely been my concern because the, the pattern of water flow is likely to be beyond our capacity to use the water when we need it. Uh, that's going to change. Yeah. I just want to follow up on that, that in Montana, the Department of Environmental Quality is leading an effort to actually look at moving beaver to drainages that historically had beaver for that purpose. So you know about Dave Cooper's work at Colorado State on beaver, and they've already you know, really quantified the amount of cubic feet of water that's stored. So in the state of Montana, there's an interagency effort through the Wetlands Council to do just that. So it's, it's a little tricky, but um, they're going to be working to move beaver to where they need to be. And it's kind of exciting. I, I think, you know, we're, we're looking at a big loss of storage in our snowpack and trying to figure out what we do and what all the different ways are that we can do to, to make up for that is going to be one of our big challenges for sure. Yeah. You were talking about um, today's challenges uh, being inherited from past policies. And in Montana, the exempt wells is a specific policy that's often pointed to something we've inherited and should talk about changing. 
do have a top three list for Montana of water policies we've inherited that deserve special attention. Mm -hmm. Well, exempt wells would be right up there. <laughs> and it's, it's being addressed through a rulemaking process now, thanks to the advocacy of senior water rights holders and conservation groups that, are, that have been impacted by that. So that's a change, at least in the works. Um, we probably, uh, they're probably, we've made good progress in addressing in-stream flows and allowing the leasing of, in, of waters for in-stream flows by, by private parties, we probably could do better and allow a broader use of, of that. Um, I'd have to think about my other, my, my third of the top three, but um, um, probably has to do with water quality and I'd have to think about that. But, um, and it could be, yeah, I just have to think about that. That's a good question though, top three, the hit list. Yeah. I was just wondering, um, I know for, for home use, like new technologies can, can really lead to drastic improvements in water efficiency, but as far as agricultural stuff, how does our sort of current practice stack up against best practice and how would you, like what are some ideas about shifting it towards more efficient use? This is the question about agricultural water use and, and what sort of how big is the potential for savings. It, it kind of falls into two areas and one would be what you're growing. Um, the value of the crops and whether we're making wise choices based on where we're pouring our water. And the other one is our technique for pouring the water. So you can, you can keep growing the crops that you're growing, which is in the West mostly hay. That's where we're putting most of the water. It's the lowest valued, easiest grown, and pretty water consumptive crop. Um, and you do it more efficiently. Or you could, um, if water uses shift, we could perhaps be irrigating less land for higher valued crops. So there's a lot of opportunity for irrigating crops more efficiently with drip systems or center pivot if you've been flooding. Um, it's, I don't have the numbers, but a lot of studies have been done that show very large potential savings of water. And, and really, but then the other question is what are we growing and what are we growing it for? And that's a big bunch of choices that are made by private parties but influenced by public policy. So we could influence some of that with the, in, with the various subsidies that we have. Um, uh, what was I gonna say about that? But um, I had another point to make to follow up. Um, I'm gonna have to think about it. The market forces are encouraging even without regulation, market forces are encouraging a movement of water out of agriculture. I know my point was, is that in the big picture, about, on average, about 80% of the water that's used in the West is used for irrigated agriculture. 80 to 90% in some places. So, just in the big picture, without thinking of any local variations and all the intricacies of doing this, if we were to save 10% of our irrigated water, which is very doable, in the big picture, very doable, that doubles what we have available for all the other uses. So just given raw numbers and without any fine tuning, there's a lot of potential. We could save more than 10%. The devil's in the details, and we actually don't wanna just dry up a lot of farmland or change it necessarily. There's a lot we wanna preserve about it, but there's a lot of room for saving water in agriculture. And a lot of it may be financed by those who will benefit from those savings. So it's not just a burden on the back of the irrigated farmers. Is there a question? Yeah. I had a, another damn question. Um, one of our another our damn question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> our um, first speaker mentioned very casually um, for as a clean energy solution, um, increasing our hydropower, our reliance on hydropower. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk about that a little bit from a policy standpoint, considering our public views of dams in the West. Yeah, the question's about hydropower as a component in a clean energy future. And it is true that when you produce water through turbines, you're not emitting um, greenhouse gases. But you're also, the dams that we've built and we have the biggest ones are in the west. The largest number of dams impacting rivers are in the eastern part of the US, but the largest dams and the ones holding back the most water 
are in the West, and they've permanently altered the living systems around those rivers. So the impacts are enormous. And the idea of adding a lot more of those obstacles to these rivers that are already tenuous is not very appealing um, to produce this. But there are a lot of different kinds of hydropower uh, technologies developed now that don't require such large impoundments that are more run of the river kind and small head hydropower that's being encouraged. That's a big hot new thing now um, that's being done with potentially a lot less impact. And I'm much more encouraged by things on the coast like wave technology where you're, you're actually not impounding anything. You're, you have other potential impacts, but there's a lot of other ways to use water's movement and power without messing up our rivers a lot more in the West. I guess I'd prefer to not see a lot more of that. Uh, there's a lot of push now for wind power, which is great when the wind's blowing. When it doesn't, they're looking for uh, replacements for it. Do you see much of a push for pump back hydro PD mm -hmm. uh, three supplements? Yeah, there's a question about using technologies like pump storage hydropower mm -hmm. generation to fill in uh, power when the the grid needs it, like when the wind isn't blowing to, to power the, um, the generators. That's, that's one of the other technologies that I'm talking about. It can have a pretty big impact because it can be dewatering, but it can be done um, probably with lesser impacts than putting a big dam plugging up a river. Um, that's certainly among the many uh, <laughs> proposals that are being talked about that are proliferating around this area right now. I don't know. I've seen you can also dewater a stream pretty thoroughly using a pump storage, so it has to be done carefully, but you know, there are lots of ways we can go about this, and I think we have to look at all of them, probably. There's a question in the back. Can you tell us to what extent is water pumping in the West out of replenishable aquifers as opposed to, or out of, as opposed to fossil waters that won't be replenishable? Mm -hmm. The question is how much of the groundwater pumping that we're doing is, 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 out of, is being replenished um, versus that that's fossil? And I would have to ask a hydrologist for the answer to that. I don't know the numbers. I'm thinking it's more the fossil than the replenished. Um, we've got some good hydrologists here in the front row. I'm looking to them and they're shaking their heads. Depends on where you are. I don't know overall numbers. Um, there are, I, I would say there are some basins that are being used very actively in terms of pumping water back in and then pulling it out. They're in California, in Arizona, uh, Colorado, probably a few other places. But overall, I think most of our groundwater consumption is probably out of uh, closed off aquifers. But I'm not a hydrologist. I don't know the numbers, unless you guys know. You don't. Another question? Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about the desalinization process and what sort of challenges are posed by that process and why that's not a more widespread solution? Yeah, well, desalinization is being used in other parts of the world, and it's being used where water is a lot shorter than it is here. It's extremely expensive. That's the main problem. Um, it does use a lot of electricity. So it raises that question of our energy consumption and greenhouse gas emissions that might um, you know, exacerbate our water shortages. Um, and it produces very heavily salt-laden um, discharge water that has to be dealt with, and that's tricky. Um, the, those are the main issues about it. I mean, ocean water, if you're near the ocean and you have access to it, it's a great source of water and this could potentially be a great supply for coastal areas. But so far, uh, and there are some pilot projects underway in, in northern and southern California, um, and there's this desalting plant that's being used um, periodically to clean up Colorado River water, which becomes salty because of the way we irrigate with that water. Um, but so far, it's not been proven feasible as a regular source of water yet compared to other sources. And that's, I mean, it's, it's like an order of, oh, four or five times as expensive to get 
desalted water as a permanent supply for a community. So right now, I mean, it's, that's the main obstacle to it, I'd say. And I think permitting has been an issue in terms of these effects that it has. Is there another question back here? Yeah. Um, you talked about it might be necessary to look into wilderness areas as far as uh, water water holding projects. And I was curious why you thought that was necessary. And then, um, like, just uh, like how significant would those projects really be to the larger scheme of water in the West? Yeah, the question was about me saying something about actually having reservoirs in wilderness areas and, and that possibility. How important would that be? I don't see that as a main linchpin of our strategy. I used it as an example of, I think we have to look all over the place at, at what we're going to do to deal with this loss of the virtual reservoir of our snowpack. And among the proposals I expect that we'll see is ways of holding water back. Um, and I, when I use the, the image of a sponge that our mountains, our, our high mountain areas, our mostly designated wilderness areas are like a sponge that holds water uh, when it falls and then releases it gradually over time when we need it. Um, hydrologists don't tend to like that um, description very much. It, I haven't found one that works better to describe it. But the point is we're losing the holdback capacity and we need to figure out how to adapt and hold the water back. And what I'm suggesting is there may be all kinds of proposals that we need to at least consider, um, some of which are very compatible with the natural processes like encouraging beavers to live where they've lived before to hold water back, um, restoring meadows where they've perhaps been degraded, uh, getting rid of old roads that have been causing sediment that's damaging the streams and uh, impacting water quality. But I think among the many possibilities are proposals to hold water back in some sort of reservoir system and I don't know what that looks like. I just have heard, you know, I just think that's one of the things we're going to be hearing about as a possibility and I'm not speaking in favor of it exactly but I'm saying we're going to be thinking about how to, how to make, how to restore the function where we're losing a natural function of a major snowpack. Um, what do we do? And one of the things we might need to do is enhance the water holding capacity of the high country for the water to come to us when we need it later. It's a possibility, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that uh, idea is interesting. Uh, I think it was in the 80s, the Water Service uh, blew up some dams that were handmade on natural lakes up in the high country. A friend of mine was on that project. He didn't like it a lot, but that was his job. So they were going around blowing up the man-made lake uh, dams, shrinking those lakes. Well, you know, historically, I, and and I mean, our our deep and and deeply held public value for wilderness is that it's a place where we don't see the human hand, we don't see the work of man, and where we've designated wilderness for some of that has existed, we've tried to remove it and restore it. And I'm not against that. Nonetheless, I'm saying conditions are changing. And I think there are lots of proposals that are probably going to be on the table. And um, I, I don't think we're going to see big, dramatic, concrete dams in the wilderness. I don't think that's likely at all. But I do think that there are many different ways that we'll be trying to restore this natural function that we're losing and likely to lose a lot more. Yeah. What, what? the status on um, the waste of water recycling or reclamation? Because I know there's, there's uh, I've heard of systems that can be uh, recycled that and clean it out and for, for human use, but I didn't really mention anything about that. I'm just curious. Yeah, the question's about what we sometimes call gray water and um, reusing water that's been used through your system. Um, it's actually being pursued all over the place. This is, this is part of, when I talk about conservation and efficiency, this is one of the major strategies, is to capture water, make the most of its use. And that whole system, the prairie waters, they call it an aurora, that's a nice way to call it, but it's wastewater. It's, it's, they sometimes call it toilet to tap. It's water that has been used and treated, released, filtered through the ground, captured, retreated, and it's being reused again. 
Um, and that's been done for landscaping use and for non-consumptive uses for quite a while. And people have individually at their homes put in reuse processes. But to actually capture this, reuse it within the urban area for domestic use has kind of a big hurdle to get over in terms of people's attitudes. And that's probably one of the bigger, um, that's why you call it something like prairie waters. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so these um, these recycled waters, I'd imagine the, the filtering process uses some sort of chemicals. And then, what I mean, what are the processes for um, for recycling these waters from from the toilet? Because if there's chemicals, what do they do? Tailings or how how is that all dealt with? Yeah, the question's about the, the actual technique that's used to clean the water, and I can't answer it specifically, but we already do this to our water. So we, you know, our sewer system collects water. It has a multi-stage process by which things are filtered out and then cleaned and put through um, processes to, to be clean enough to be released back into a river. Well, when you're on a river, you've got cities one after another down the river. Each one is already taking out, treating, and using the water that came from the city upstream. Um, we've been doing this already, I guess is my point. It's been diluted, but it's been treated in that way. I can't describe all the, the processes that they use, but it's the similar to how we treat our drinking water already. They, in some of these cases, they use membranes that they pass the water through to filter out very small contaminants. But um, I can't describe the technical processes. That's not my expertise at all. Yeah. Martin? Yeah, will you conjecture a little bit about how uh, you suspect reform might be sped along a little bit in the future? I mean, given that prior appropriation doctrine is primarily state law, uh, what, what role, for example, do you see the, the feds playing mm -hmm. in, in maybe expediting some of this change? Well, the feds' role um, is big and potential. And there's been a lot of interesting discussion about that. And it's probably not going to happen in the next few years. But potentially, um, the federal government has a lot of incentives in terms of funding projects. And it's not just water projects, but uh, conditioning funding on many other activities. Um, they could put conditions on conservation measures, on state standards, on efficiency standards for water appliances and, and water uses. Um, they could directly subsidize in the way they did in the past to help develop the West. They could directly subsidize better uses of water and movement of water. Um, there's not going to be a lot of money for that anytime soon. But I think we'll also see regulatory programs. And um, there have been proposals for what's called cooperative federalism, like we have for the Clean Water Act or the Clean Air Act. If we had similar kinds of like a baseline of federal standards for water conservation and efficient use. And the states had a choice of how to pursue it, but they did have to meet this, this baseline. Um, we could have a system like that that would be just as strict as our Clean Water Act or Clean Air Act and would still give states a lot of discretion as to how they do it, how they achieve it. I think the, all the different areas of policy change in response to climate change, the one that I find the most compelling is the need to reduce how much water we take out of our rivers and how much we use. That's so compelling and it's so immediate and it's so hard. But the potential is there based on how wasteful we actually are with our water. So if it takes incentives, if it takes a regulatory program, if it takes much, much better communication and education, all those things could add up to some pretty good water savings and would really help us be ready for these much less certain water supply futures that we're seeing predicted. Yeah. You talked a little bit about in-stream flows. Um, in the future, if our, in -stream, if our amount of water in our rivers is going to get lower, is there any initiatives or plans in place to guarantee in-stream flows if landowners would guarantee a certain amount of water? The questions about in-stream flow protection, and boy, they're going to be super important with the projected impacts of climate change. And happily, we have in-stream flow programs in place in every western state. We're 
we've done a good job in 30 years of changing that part of the prior appropriation doctrine, um, but they vary tremendously. And some of them are, are far more protective than others. Um, and there's always efforts underway to improve those. Um, one of the biggest problems of in-stream flows is that if you get, that you really need to get a senior water right because otherwise it's not worth much, it's not protected much. So really it's gonna come down to opportunities for groups or for the, in many places it's only a state government agency that can hold these rights. So broadening perhaps who has access to them, who can fund them, would bring conservation groups with pocketbooks to help finance this kind of conservation, would give the incentive to the landowner to share his or her water in this way and still be able to, to make use of it. Um, and in some cases, these are not done through the legal rights system at all. And examples in Montana, there are some really good examples of just voluntary agreements to not take water out during certain times when the landowner is aware that the fish or other aquatic resources are especially vulnerable. And those are being done through these watershed groups and cooperative efforts where people know each other and they've learned and they care and they just care. And sometimes it comes down to just knowing a person, learning the impact of what you're doing and caring about it. So I don't mean to be all about the regulated, regulation hammer. It has to be there often, but in many cases, in these particular stretches, <coughs> in-stream flows are being improved because of voluntary actions too. The state programs could be better. There's just no doubt. And there's a lot of good proposals out there for improving them. I was wondering if this morning I served this uh, ground on an issue that where fracking comes into play, policy restricting or controlling or generating that is pretty documented that has a major impact on the lot. Yeah, the questions about um, hydraulic fracturing uh, as a part of extracting um, natural gas from underground. Will you explain that for people? <laughs> Um, wow, this is um, not my technical expertise either, but it's increasingly being used in parts of the West. Um, Wyoming's one place where there's a great deal of this going on. It's an it's a effort where they, oh boy, I am really not a scientist or engineer, but they, they go in and fracture the bedrock and push, they push chemicals, they push in, chemicals in and the emitted water comes out and it's highly salty and contaminated and has to be discharged. And in the process, they get more of the gas out that they want. But the discharged water is the real problem. Um, contamination of the aquifer is another problem, but the, the legal issue that's risen has been about the contaminated water that comes out that gets discharged into rivers or spread over the ground and sometimes doing a great deal of damage to the ground. And the question about this was, I see policy affecting the surface water, surface flow to be affected, they're going to be more dependent on subsurface, whether it's aquifer water to I don't know what we need. So yeah. It, it's a big mess. I mean, that's the truth. And, and it, it's complicated because you get into these problems with different ownership of, of mineral rights underground and surface rights. And what happens when the person um, exercising his mineral rights is damaging the surface right of the, the landowner. Um, it gets into issues about whether pumping water out and polluting it and putting it in a stream is considered a beneficial use under state law. Um, and it's issues of um, federal law about, about uh, mineral resources. So I really can't propose how to fix that. I know that right now we have a lot of, um, the states are all approaching it differently. Um, and even local governments in some cases are approaching it. The federal government is doing a big study on the life cycle of fracking water, what happens to it, where it comes from, what happens to the contaminants. That's a long-term effort by the EPA. Department of Interior is doing studies on the impacts of this. And there are, have been several proposals to just require disclosure because right now the companies that pump the chemicals underground don't even have to say what they're pumping. And we've just learned that some of them have been pumping diesel fuel underground to, to push this out. So there's a lot of potential damage to the resource and there's already damage to the surface of landowners who are impacted by this. 
and it's being sorted out in a variety of places, but there's no one answer because of all the different legal rights that are being um, impacted by it. I do not have a good answer on that. It's a problem, and it's, they're, they're broadening the use of it quite a bit, too. I'd like to add, join me in thank you, sir. Thank you.